What's up, everybody? Welcome back to True North Project, or welcome for the first time. This is Christian. So today my conversation is with Dr. and Rabbi Mark Gaffney, um, or Dr. Mark Gaffney. He's not a medical doctor, but he is a, a philosopher, incredibly um, well-read, well-educated, and prolific writer. And uh, you know, he's the he's the co-president of the Center of World Philosophy and Religion, um, and he's you know, one of the, in my mind, cutting edge thinkers in, in, uh, the domain of philosophy and, uh, sense making in some sense. So, um, you know, but he's got, he's got a, uh, a very, um, well, I guess you would say rabbinic, uh, sort of, uh, flavor and, and a, uh, a, God fearing man in some sense. And it's, it's actually, but not in a, not in a way that turns me off at all, but in a way that's just, you can tell he's, he's full of the, the passion for it. So, um, I want to just nod to Mark because his, his, his work caught my attention. I found out about him on, uh, Aubrey Marcus's podcast and the, uh, the concept that he has of, of the unique self and the unique self symphony really just like landed for me and took, uh, took my understandings, uh, and, and sort of like my own journey of, of sense making and soul searching and sort of like took it, I, I feel like a step further. Um, and it felt like an insight and, and, and a, and a light bulb moment for me when I, when I found his work. And, um, so this is for me, a, a conversation that I'm really, really stoked about and really stoked to share. Um, we were, we were, you know, we have so much to talk about because of, of you know, this, the spectrum of Mark's work and his, and his thinking. Um, but this conversation still, uh, is a good, is a good starting place and we will continue it with future conversations. Hopefully, uh, Mark says he is totally down. So, um, I don't know what this is going to turn into in terms of like a, a series or how many, how many, um, parts of this, but it is, uh, strap in for an interesting ride. And if you are a Mormon or an ex Mormon or a don't know Mormon or a Jack Mormon or a whatever Mormon. So like th there's a, uh, Mormon flavor to, to this episode and potentially to future episodes, uh, with Mark, just because of the, um, nature of the story that he's telling and he's not a Mormon uh, or an ex Mormon or anything, but he, but because of my story and because of my past and the way that I arrived here into this conversation with Mark, um, it just became quite relevant to use a sort of a case study in terms of bridging what he's saying and what, uh, you know, they're, they're slinging over there at the center for world philosophy and religion, <laughs> cosmoerotic humanism, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. There's a, uh, there's a new sort of story that's emerging and I find it to be um, highly worth considering and worth exploring. So, you know, any, anyone who is making any sort of real attempt at weaving together a new collective story or a superstructure for humanity to go on, to, to make the leap from the sort of paradigm of separation as, as Eisenstein would call it, um, the, the space that we're in where we're, you know, destroying our own planet and we're at war with each other and we have nukes pointed at everyone and, that's kind of like a, a failure mode. And uh, it ultimately leads to some sort of collapse, uh, like, like catastrophe, or it leads to a dystopia or to both. And um, there's, there's a, a radical need for a new story um, or for some sort of shift. And I think story is the only thing that really fits the bill in terms of how we can coordinate humanity and, and how we are coordinating. It's all through stories. And we talk about story quite a bit. And, and so, um, hang in there. If at any point this feels like a lot, or it feels like it might be too many, uh, said in too many words or whatever. Um, I think it's worth using your discernment and also making a real genuine attempt at, at, at following the, the conversation and following Mark's, um, like Mark's signal. And I'm trying to do the best I can to follow and to, be a bridge and to, uh, try to amplify the signal in a way that's, that's meaningful and, and virtuous and positive. So hopefully, um, 
you enjoyed this conversation. I mean, I, I really, really enjoyed this conversation with Mark and it's very energizing and it feels almost like a, it feels almost like a milestone of some kind in my, in my journey in terms of, um, in terms of like, it's been 12 years since I've left Mormonism and, uh, the first five years were sort of just, you know, like running from it and, and a bit more on the side of, of just partying or nihilism, not quite full nihilism, but, you know, quite a cynical perspective and sort of detached. And then, uh, there's, you know, my, my journey since then, which is the last seven years or so of, of since, of, since this kind of awakening experience and since flow tanks and since psychedelics and since breath work and since all these other, you know, retreats and modalities and things that I've been exploring to try to, um, first heal and then discover who I am really and discover what I'm here for. And, and what is sort of my ikigai or what is, what is my path? What is the unique journey for my life? And then finding that North star and fully sending it. That's what I'm, that's what I'm attempting to do with my life in some sense. And, uh, uh, the last seven years have been a bit of a transformation in terms of what I, who I was, uh, at the level of, you know, leaving, um, just the corporate gig or the, you know, chasing the dollar, right. And, and novelty and hedonism. So, you know, not that I'm not a bit of a hedonist now, <laughs> but, um, but now I feel like I'm at this sort of new threshold and this new, uh, chapter that's, that's unfolding. Um, and it involves this project. It involves this podcast. It involves, uh, more writing and it involves art drop, which is, uh, another conversation. But, um, if you're curious about that, you can check out the conversation I had with Nico, um, earlier on the podcast. And this is going to be, um, hopefully art drop. I mean, not hopefully, but eventually this will lead to some sort of crossroads or some sort of intersection rather of, of ideas between, um, you know, what I'm, what I've been talking about on this podcast, what I've been exploring and what, uh, you know, the guests that will be coming on this podcast will be talking about and all the visionary artists that are coming on this podcast and all the storytellers and all of the authors and all of the people who were trying to weave the, um, the story of the more beautiful world. And we're going to hopefully empower those storytellers with the most cutting edge innovation and technology and um, the best structures and toolkits for amplifying their signal. So that is sort of the vibe here at True North Project and what we're trying to do and at Art Drop and what we're trying to do. And this podcast is now going to be presented by Art Drop. So it is uh, officially my first, uh, I guess you would say sponsor, but it's more like a partner. And, um, you know, Art Drop is, is a project that I'm actively participating in and uh, giving as much energy as I can muster and trying to support as much as possible because I find it to be a, uh, a potential for a massive catalyst of a positive change. So that's kind of the vibe. And I hope you stick around for the journey. And I hope you enjoy this un uninterrupted conversation with uh, Dr. Mark Gaffney. Much love. Hey, everyone. Actually, real quick, before this conversation, I want to plug my first sponsor of this project. So uh, my, my recommendation is that you check out LumiGummies.com if you're interested in the highest, uh, highest quality cannabis edibles. Um, and use true code TRUENORTH to get 20% off. Uh, and that will support the project. And there's a link in the description for you and a little reminder. So check it out if you want the, my, the best edibles I've been able to find, organic, strain specific, high quality, um, sourced ethically, and all that stuff, all the good stuff. So, and legal, 100% legal in all 50 states, and they'll, and they'll ship directly to you. Um, so basically, the game has changed with cannabis because of the 2018 farm bill. And this is legal hemp derived cannabis that hits uh, like the best edibles you've ever had. So use code true North for 20% off and now enjoy this conversation with Mark Gaffney. Mark, thank you for taking the time and for being here. And um, I've been wanting to talk to you for a while. So 
we, you know, try to make the most of this and just jump straight into it by way of uh, just making I, a bridge. I just do have to say one thing. I mean, and I, I'm going to try and appear as a person with um, depth and gravitas. But before we get there, the real reason I'm here is because I heard you had great glasses. I just wanted well, to say that. Right, Those are good glasses, man. Shout out to uh, Raw Optics. So All right. Raw there, Optics. Yeah. Not, even one, not even one of the sponsors. Oh, my God. That is no. so cool. All right, take us inside, man. I can't wait yeah, to talk. Yeah, to you. yeah. I got I got brainwashed into the blue blocker cult, so here I am <laughs> wearing the bra optics. Um, yeah. Right. So, um, just so to give people a little bit of a bridge here, because this will be a lot of people's first time encountering your stuff, even though I've I've talked about your work on the podcast before. What is um, give people a little bit of context? Um, who's Mark Gaffney? Oh God, that's too big of a question, but I can tell you what what we're gonna we're gonna talk about. Actually, a dear friend of mine, uh, Sally Kempton, who was one of the um, wonderful teachers of Kashmir Shaivism, which is kind of the root tradition of Hinduism, once wrote an article called "Who Is Mark Goffney? and I read that and I said, "What does it have to do with me?" So, who who we are is a great and beautiful question, but maybe that's a good way in. I am madly delighted and kind of ecstatically trembling before the universe, before she, in this moment in time, which is a time between worlds, it's a time between stories. We're confronted with an unimaginably significant metacrisis, which is sometimes called existential risk, right? The potential actual death of humanity, or our attempt to solve that risk through creating structures that cause the death of our humanity. So what I've tried to engage in is to invite a band of thinkers, feelers, you know, leading, leading luminaries, friends, students, partners, something like what Marcello Ficinio did in the Renaissance when they started the Florentine Platonic Academy, which was funded actually by Cosmo de' Medici. And they said, the Black Death just swept, sweeps through Europe, carcasses on the street, the old world order is breaking down, a new one hasn't been born. We don't have the resources to get to every village, although we'd like to be in every village and holding every person you know, in their agony and, and, and in their pain and to actually at least hold them. But we can't do that. So what we have to do is in order to respond to the suffering, we have to create the future. We have to actually access a memory of the future and tell a new story, a new story of value that actually moves us into a new world. And that new world was called modernity. Now, let me, let me put that aside for a second. Now, back to your question. So what I've tried to do is, together with Zach Stein, my dear friend Ken Wilbur, right, we founded the Think Tank together, um, friends Daniel, Christina, Sally Kempton, Laurie Galperin, right, we tried to gather a, a band of people from around the world, each who are leaders in their field, right, meaning, and I mean this tenderly, but they don't come from a kind of self-proclaimed human potential or new age kind of expertise which actually is not grounded and not credible. They come from very, very deep at the leading edges of their field. They're deeply accomplished in, in the world. And yet they have a sense that there's a better way to do this. They have a sense that whether that's someone like John Mackey, right, who, who was our board chair for a bunch of years, who did food in a different way in America, or Lori Galpern, who's doing you know, mental health in a different way, or Zach, who's doing education in a different way, or Ken, who did systems theory in a different way, and or Barbara Marks Hubbard, right, who was the chair for a bunch of years. So it's that, that kind of group of people, which I've tried to gather, and we're, we're actually trying to do exactly what da Vinci and Ficinio did in the Renaissance, which is, let's see if we can gather the leading edge validated insights of all the wisdom in the world. Right. And so I, if you look at my desk here, I'm reading molecular biology and I'm reading, you know, physics and I'm reading lots in chemistry. Right. And of course, you know, I'm, lots of Aramaic sacred texts and biblical texts and Kashmir Shaivite texts and different texts of Taoism. And then you have a bunch of anthropology texts and you have Chinese texts and you have Russian literature. This is all literally I'm describing what's around me literally on my desk now. 
and and we're trying to read and study and practice across disciplines and then weave together from the validated insights of all the wisdom streams in the traditional world, the pre-modern world, in the modern world, and in the postmodern world, into a new synergy, a new story of value that we can tell to a bunch of truckers in Idaho and a bunch of farmers in Mongolia, right? And 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 13-year-olds will get it and eight-year-olds will get it and and the wisest sages will will ponder it and be in it. And it's not a dominating story. It's not a domination narrative. It's actually a shared story or what I like to call a shared grammar of value as a context for our diversity. Right? Because yeah. if we don't have that, if we don't have that, and that's what I call a superstructure, barring Harris's term, we're not going to try and Fixing the infrastructure at a time of meta crisis is utterly necessary. And by infrastructure, we mean, you know, are there bioweapons in the wastewater? Okay, can we detect those bioweapons? You know, social structure, can we pass, you know, better regulatory mechanisms because, you know, law is based on precedent and tech is moving so fast, there's no precedent. So our regulatory me mechanisms have collapsed. And of course, regulation used to be emerged from government and government used to kind of bind business, but government doesn't even have the people that understand. There's no one in government that actually understands artificial intelligence because everyone who's working in artificial intelligence doesn't want a $70,000 a year salary. So the government can't even ask the right questions, right? So there's no binding function. So that's so social structure. That's not working too well. So what's the right way to approach the meta crisis? It's, it's what Da Vinci did at that time between worlds and time between stories. He said, we have, we have to address suffering. We have to, and how do we do that? We actually enact a memory of the future, which becomes a strange attractor, which allures us into a new possible future. And that created modernity. And last sentence, and that's, that was a long answer to your question, right? So for which I apologize somewhat insincerely. But, but what happened was, to the extent that da Vinci got the structures right, which says they got it right, they created, right, my dear friend, right, all of the dignities of modernity. And, and there are many dignities to modernity. And you and I are talking to each other right now and this possibility as you're on the West Coast and I'm on the East Coast and we're linked together and we found each other through a kind of digital intimacy, you know, multiple vectors. These are all, this very conversation is built on the platform of the dignities of modernity, which we should extol, and they're beautiful. And to the precise extent they didn't get the plot lines right, they left key things out of the plot lines of reality, like value, for example, which we'll get to, they actually created the seed of collapse. Right? And so we're now at a moment where the social capital that modernity and even post-modernity borrowed from the traditional world, that loan has been called, right? We're living in a world in which the experience of the leading legacy structures in the world, whether they're political, whether they're psychological, whether they're entertainment, whether they're philosophical, assume there's no field of value. And from that place, from that shifting quicksand, right, we're trying somehow to address the meta crisis. can't be done. Now, we don't want to go back. We can't go back to the pre-modern religions. That didn't work, and we'll talk about why. But we can't get stuck in modernity, which just let's just assume value. No, post-modernity called the loan. Post-modernity said, you can't, you can't make shit up anymore. You can't pretend. You can't, you, can't, you can't do that. We're going to actually say it's all just a story. It's all just made up. And that's essentially what Foucault does in Genealogy of Morals. And, you know, Derrida is not nearly as deep as Foucault, but he's, he's expressing that sentiment. It's all just a story. So how yeah. do you respond to that? that that's, that's what my, my soul and lifeblood, right, is about that. Yeah. One or the other. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for your patience and that long answer, my friend. No, of course. Yeah, no, I, I you have a... Uh you know, you've mentioned the books on your desk and I was already, I was already sort of like in fear and trembling of your, <laughs> no, just, just go joking, but you have, you do have like a powerful, um, mind and you're, you're spitting some pretty powerful juice in lots of ways. And this is why I wanted to talk to you. Um, so, uh, I'm following you. I'm with you because I think I have the context. I've read some of your work. I've been listening to you for a while. I want to, I want to try to function as a bit of a bridge. 
and okay, try to um, be a translator somewhat and also see if I have anything of value to add. Um, Which but, and, and, and I'm also... Yes, I'm sure you have enormous <laughs> amount of value to add and I look forward to hearing it. And yeah, thank you. Started. Thank you. And I'm going to try to use my discernment as best as possible. Um, for me, um, I've been, I'm in the project of my 30s of, of, of saving the baby from the bathwater of religion. Uh, yeah. That I I threw everything out in my twenties, and so this is this is my attempt at um, being born again, so to speak. <laughs> so again. yeah, so um, just because of some involuntary sort of experiences, you know, that were that yeah. were quite mystical. So um, good uh, to your point. Um, Modest Mouse, one of my favorite artists, has a lyric: uh, "Language is the liquid that we're all dissolved in," and. Uh, the funny, the funny second half of that lyric is great at fixing problems after it creates a problem. <laughs> so we're, oh. we're kind of in this, uh, we're kind of in this interesting, um, game of humanity where, where everything's built on stories and, and we're storytelling creatures. And that's probably the, the primary differentiator between us and the rest of the animal kingdom in some sense. It's like, we're, you know, we're storytelling apes and that's given rise to all of these other structures like you're talking about. So that superstructure of story gives rise to the social structures of our institutions and our modes of collaboration and coordination as a species, as a, now a global species. So that would be our economy, our stories about money, our stories about uh, trade and nationalism and all of those things. These are, these are deep, deep layers of structures that are all rooted in language and story. And and uh, then the infrastructure, as you mentioned, the actual architecture and the uh, the ways that we're doing energy and the you know industrialized food supply and the six continent supply chains and all these things are byproducts of our story. So I would uh, what I would suggest is that for the sake of today, for this conversation, since we only have about an hour left, um, we try to hone in on a particular part of the story, which is the story of the self. And, and the story's relationship of the self to its environment or to the cosmos or to God or however you want let's, to articulate let's, it. Let's, let's totally do that. Um, but right, <laughs> well, we're going to totally do that, my friend. But you just had three things I want to just kind of, just so we can kind of get a little context. So one, yeah. you said, let's talk about religion. So I want to just kind of put this on the table and maybe this will be a different conversation. When Ken and I first started the center, we called it Center for World Spirituality because we didn't want to use the word religion. We have renamed the center, the Center for World Philosophy and Religion, with great intention, with, without a kind of world religion or a universal grammar of value or a story of value rooted in first principles and first values. And we have to explain all those phrases, but without those, I don't think that there's an actual possibility that humanity will survive as we recognize it. So the need to re-engage religion is essential. So I want to just kind of say that. Now, Voltaire wasn't wrong when he, you know, his clarion call of modernity was remember the cruelties. All right. And there's there there were good reasons for David Hume, you know, and Kant tried to modulate it, but to, there were good reasons to throw the baby out, right? There were, those were excellent reasons. And now, right, and your, your, your kind of sweet frame of the baby in the bathwater is not wrong, right? So there's, there's a deep conversation that needs to be had about religion. And it's not just about the shared truths of the great religions. It's not just that, although that's important. It's actually about the unique quality the unique intimacy, or if you will, the unique self of every religion. Right? Every religion has unique quality and fabric of intimacy that needs to play its instrument in the unique self-symphony without trying to hijack the symphony. And in pre-modernity, essentially, each religion said, my instrument is the only one that is playing music. And although your instrument seems to sound like music, it doesn't, so I'm going to break your instrument and break you. Right. And that, that was kind of the rivalrous conflict between religions in the, in the medieval period. So, so what does it mean to come back and reclaim religion at a higher level of consciousness? Let's put that aside. I just, you put it on the table. So I just want to say that's something we have to come back to. That's one. Second, and then we'll get to the second. You mentioned, um, 
you know, language is a liquid in which we all dissolve, which is a, a beautiful quote from your, your artist friend. So, so let's just play with that for a second so we can find it. And, and then you, you made a little leap, right, which wasn't a bad leap between language and story, although they're not quite the same. But you kind of kind of mixed in story, the language and story. And then you went to kind of a broader conversation about, you know, actually, wow, that's that's the insight. It's all just built on these stories. Right. And those stories, superstructure, then generate right the kind of the kind of broken infrastructure. So all, all good. So let's just go slow for a second. OK. There's a beautiful word, right, my friend in Hebrew called beged, B-E-G-E-D, beged, beged. And beged, clothing or garb, right, has two meanings. So it would be in, in Hebrew. And if those of you who are listening, don't, don't get lost on the Hebrew. It's, just imagine you heard a Sanskrit word. You'd hang around and be excited. So let's do a Hebrew word, right? So beged is beit gimel dalet, ba-ga-da, beged. And beged means clothing, garb, and it means betrayal. Two meanings. The first letter is aleph, alpha, right, the alpha. And aleph is silent. It's the silent letter. So there's a way in which language clothes it, it garbs the aleph, it garbs the silence. And there's a way in which language betrays the silence. So, so BCD, Beit Gim Labud's language. Now, our language has to be grounded in the silence. And the silence, let's call the silence for now, let's call the silence the field of value. Let's call the silence the Tao. Now, if my story is emergent from the Tao. It's emergent from the field of value. Then my story will be, in its core, saying something that's true. And what we've done is we've made a, 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 a fundamental mistake. And I think that this could be the first place we could just spend a minute and then we'll, because our self story is going gonna, is gonna to be, it's going to emerge from this. In other words, are all stories wrong? Well, they're not actually. But it's not just the not, it's not just the not all stories are wrong, but let's see if we can do something like insanely deep. So you said another thing, and again, with, with total tender respect and honor, and just, I'm going to be real precise and just what a delight to do together. You said, oh, human beings, right? Start telling stories, storytelling apes, right? Which is, which is the way that story is told. You're, you're telling it the way it's told by anthropologists. So obviously you're a wise man and you're doing good reading, but the anthropologists got it wrong. And this is very, very important. Story itself is a structure of reality. In other words, story is not something that emerges at the human level. And actually, the, the very first book of esoteric Western wisdom, right, which is between about 100 before the Common Era, somewhere around there, called the Book of Yitzirah, the book of kind of the ground of, of the creative, about 455 words, right? And it opens with a statement that says reality is constituted by sipur, story, and mispar, mispar, it's the same root word, number or cipher in English, cipher is a number, right? So there's two grounds to reality, story and number. So mathematics, right? But actually mathematics themselves are telling a story, right? And mathematics themselves have values, right? There's it's telling, and the, the mathematical story is so compelling and cogent, coherent that it can put a man on the moon. That's a, quite a powerful story. It's not a not just a made up story. It's a story that has interiors and exteriors and has enormous efficacy in the real world. The real world is built on, right, a story of mathematics, numbers, and it's built on a narrative structure. Now, here, stay close with me. Let's do come some original great stuff together. Let's play. So. If you think about it, let's go to the subatomic world. So you have a, it's, it's, you're a few nanoseconds after the Big Bang, right? You've got this explosion of quarks, gazillions of quarks raining in the world, right? And the gazillions of quarks are kind of like this very large singles bar, essentially, right? And what happens is not all quarks hang out with each other. Quarks, quark approaches another quark, and the quark either says, yeah, let's hang. Or the quark says, no, no, I don't think so. And that's a big deal, meaning there's a coded structure of value within quarks. And then quarks either get together in threes or they don't. If they don't get together in threes, they disappear. Now, in this early story of quarks, you have two structures of quarks, right? Two up quarks and a down quark, proton, 
two down quarks and an up quark, neutron. Interesting. Protons and neutrons, right, are then in relationship to each other. 380,000 years go by, and then we have electrons join the story. And then there's such a fierce allurement, love, eros, desire for contact and greater wholeness. Sound familiar? Right between the electron and the proton neutron structure, they come together. They're separate parts. They're drawn together. They have this enormous desire for deeper contact. They're drawn together to create a larger whole, which is called an atom. So this is really interesting. So you have actually desire. Every story has desire. The narrative arc of every story, there's always desire. The desire is to fulfill a value or an eros value, which is some form of greater wholeness, some sort of greater possibility. And in that story, right, you've got a narrative arc. There's a direction in which the separate parts want to come together and create something deeper. So a story, right, has in it, always a plot line. The plot line is always animated by desire. The desire is always to come together to create a larger whole. The larger whole always creates a new possibility of value, right? Then last piece, last piece, there's always eros at the core of the story. I think it's always a love story by its nature. Now that love story evolves. So in other words, the allurement between an electron, proton, neutron, that allurement, right, is the same allurement between Christian and his beloved. Now, it's not the exact same qualities. For example, you know, electrons probably don't do a lot of therapy. Got that. Okay, right. That's true. So there's an evolution of the love story. Love evolves and story evolves. But the four core elements of story, we're going somewhere. There's direction. There's desire. Desire discloses value, right? Desire is to create a larger whole, right? And then Crisis, right, always is an evolutionary driver. It's always that which moves reality to create larger holes. And just look what we just did. This is kind of crazy. So we just showed, right, and this is, you know, and I've, I've checked this scientifically again and again and again and again with, with the best people in science. And science obfuscates this. And I'm a big science reader, but science describes reality in terms where if you didn't know better, you would think this is mechanics. So, so for example, if you think about your cells, I, I don't know, do you have bone cells? You probably do, yeah. Skin cells, you got those going on? Okay, skin cells. So, you know, liver cells, probably got some liver cells, right? So, so in my friend, right, Lord C, in his bone cells, skin cells, liver cells, all of that stuff, he's got mitochondria. This second, you got lots of mitochondria going on. And the mitochondria are actually accessing the flow of eros in this very second. Billions of mitochondria are actually animating you and I in this very second, accessing this unimaginably gorgeous process of intimate configuration and unfolding, and are literally animating us to have this conversation in this very second as we talk. And it's a process of eros. That's what's happening right now. Not, not mysticism. <laughs> this is not some claim. Not to know this is to be ignorant, to be non-empirical, and, and to be essentially a blind fundamentalist. Right? We are animated in this second by a story, right, which is an erotic story. It's a story of Eros, which desires more life, more Eros value, which potentiates more possibility. And ultimately, from the atom, you get to kind of, you know, molecules and macromolecules and the macromolecules intensify their intimacy and they awaken as cells and et cetera. So actually, it's not that stories begin. And, and what anth anthropologists, right? And that's what I'm saying. This, we, we, we can, anthropologists say, no, no, stories begin, oh, when apes start telling stories, not true. That changes that because once you say that, you've already, you've already been bought by postmodernity, which is making a dogmatic claim which is twofold. One is it's all just stories. No, one, it's all just, one is it's all stories, one. And two is it's all just stories, right? And that's, that stories actually, they're contrived. They don't matter. That's not true. There's a whole, and my friend Yuval Harari always makes this fatal mistake. He's a parrot of postmodernity. It's just a story. Money's just a story. Yeah, money's just a story. Human rights is just a story, right? Democracy's just a story. No, go slow, man. Go slow. Actually, there are core first principles and first values of cosmos, which 
our reality's desire to fulfill. And those first principles and first values are structural inherent to cosmos, and they evolve. They're not eternal. That's where religion got it wrong. They're not, they're not eternal in the sense of unchanging. They're internal in the sense that they're beneath. They're not eternal in terms of everlasting time. They're eternal in the sense that they're beneath time. Love is real. It's eternal. It doesn't mean love never changes. It doesn't mean that Aquinas said the way Aquinas defined love is the way love should be. It means that love, the basic notion that we care for each other, that we hold each other, that we embrace each other, that we create larger holes together, that we yearn to be together. That description fits subatomic particles like it fits us. It's actually a coherent, it's an omni-coherent cosmos that can be at home in reality. I'm welcome in reality. Reality is not merely a fact. It's a story. And it's not an ordinary story, it's a love story. And that's not poetry. That's the deepest read, right, of the scientific structure of reality. And to deny that is an act of ignorance. It's not multiple perspectives. It's simply to deny science. And so that's a big deal. We just did, that's a lot. That's a... Wow. Oh, so my story, last second, and I promise to shut the fuck up, right? But it's big, right? But it's big. My story, Christian story, me and Christina, Christian and his partner, right? Christian and Mark. My story is quite literally ontologically, meaning for fucking real, not made up, for real, right? My, I won't, so I apologize for the expletive deleted. I won't say real anymore, right? But, but my story is ontologically, for real, chapter and verse in the love story of the universe. I'll live in that world. I'll take that. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. We're, in. we're in. I'm with you. So I might be, I yeah. might be uh, staring stoically, but I'm with you 100%. No, we're like, good. No, no, good. You're not looking stoic to me. No, it's good. We just, that, that's, it. that's it. If we just did that, if we just got that, we, yeah. we literally just, we literally just re we just evolved the source code of culture and cosmos right there. So I think to get it for, I mean, you've got it. Uh, I feel like I've got it. We're going to hold for one second. To get it, we're going to get back on that point. But to get it, we got to do one thing is I've got to go to the restroom. So I'll be right back in 10 seconds. (laughs) For sure. Yeah. I'll I'll, uh, I'll fill the silence with, uh, with, uh, with a pause, actually. Jump into this. This. I'm with you, but I feel like it's worth uh, teasing apart what I what I said, which was what what I meant. I meant is that um, the the story or storytelling apes. I'm I'm referring to the superstructure story. So I'm talking about the language turning into complex ideas and and tapestries of of culture and law yeah. and you know et cetera. Right. So all of the all of the um, ways in which humans create from myths and, 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 and metaphors and, and, you know, different, different texts and, and sacred texts and all these things we build up over thousands of years, these, these superstructures you're pointing to, I think a deeper structure than that, which is, um, like the river beneath the river. It's like the, the, the field in which everything is arising. Um, the Tao, as you mentioned, and, you know, the Tao has some sort of orientation. There's not a, it's it's not a it's not a, a big nothing burger. It's like wait, there's wait, actually go, go slow, go slow, go slow for a second. Let's go slow. Let's go slow. So the Tao is underneath the story. It's not the story. The Tao, or what I'm calling the field of values, underneath the story. But here's the thing. So what you're pointing to is you're exactly half right and half wrong. Okay, and and of course you may never have me on a podcast again, which will be fine. But I'll love you anyways. But just stay because I want to be just really precise because. What you're doing is you're 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 obviously whip smart, you're obviously well read, and an incredibly nice human being, right? And so you are, and you're you're in, you're, you're super insightful and intelligent, and so so you're I'm with you all the way, and with permission, gently, tenderly, right? There's a bunch of implicit inherent assumptions in what you're saying that are assumed to be true all through the spiritual world and all through the scientific world that are actually not correct. And we have to, we evolve the source code, we make a move. So go slow with me. So what you're saying, which is absolutely right, like rock star, okay, don't hate me too much now, right? What you're saying is rock star is, wow, all these built up myths and stories over all these years, lots of this stuff is just story and it's just not true. Right. We got to be able to kind of, you know, get through that and get underneath it. That's that's absolutely right. Not necessarily saying that it's not true or that it's not that that it's and what I'm saying is it's one aspect of story. Oh, exactly not true. Lots, of story. Of it's not, lots of it's not true. Lots of it is right. Lots of it. There's 
I mean, lots of it created enormous cruelty and suffering that's unimaginable, right? Now, religions fucked up in a big time, and they they have stories that are absolutely false that they assume are true fundamentalism, which is why Sunnis are killing Shiites. It's why Christians did crusades. It's why you had kind of biblical fundamentalists doing bad shit. So, in other words, you know what? You know, the Taoists did some really bad stuff along the way as well, right? The Buddhists, you know, the, we talk about beautiful Buddhism. There were actually armed monasteries killing each other over dogma, yeah. right? So, so no, you're absolutely right. No, stay, stay with you. Have you know, these things? Stories, st- stories are powerful coherers, and stories got hijacked. And the the kind of fundamental truth that the story was expressing, right, got distorted and disfigured beyond measure. It became a dogma, right, and a tool of oppression. So you're you're a thousand percent. That's all, that's all true. I just want to add one small thing. You get you get ninety five percent, but here's the five percent. And and they were reaching for something. In other words, in, in other words. So, for example, I was going to give you, I mean, here's a crazy example. Okay, let's take the notion of chosenness, right? So I was sitting with um, my dear um, friend, although we don't talk often, but, um, but we, we have, we've had a dear time in the world, the Dalai Lama. So I was in his room in Dharamsala, and we were talking about this idea of kind of chosenness, right? So the Tibetan Buddhists are pretty convinced that they're chosen. Like, if you really ask them what the real story is, no one can actually get to, they don't talk about heaven, but can get to kind of a clear awareness other than through their practices. They got a very clear sense of chosenness. Sunnis? Seems, seems, to be, seems to be baked into almost every religion. It's baked in every place. Now, here's the thing, but it's not exactly that they're wrong. So just go slow with me, okay? It's just very beautiful, right? In other words, actually, we are chosen. We actually have a fundamental need to be chosen, right? And there's that. They actually had a direct, my brother, experience of being chosen. And the Mormons that crossed, you know, went from Missouri, right, after Joseph Smith was killed and kind of made it, you know, with Brigham Young and, you know, entered Salt Lake City. They had the sense, this is the new Zion and let's build a tabernacle. And they had the sense of destiny and being chosen. And they were. The problem was they experienced chosenness as, as, I am choosing you and no one else, right? So basically, they actually took the notion of monogamy, right? Meaning, meaning God is monogamous, right? God is faithful only with one people. God chooses one people, right? And the model is monogamous marriage. But actually, it's not true, right? God is many things, but not monogamous with one people. God is polyamorous, right? Meaning God is madly in love with Taoists, and with Mormons and with Jews and all kinds of Jews and with Sunnis and with Shiites, right? And with Confucian, right? You know, adaptions and with, you know, you know the Protestants and the, and the Catholics who killed each other in the 30-year war. Actually, right, God has got a much more radical eros in which there's this sense of the unique intimacy between me and my community with the divine. That was actually true, but they mediated that through an ethnocentric prism and and Augustine comes and says, there's no redemption outside of the church, so therefore we're going to kill you. So I can actually I can actually liberate the intuition of being chosen and actually experience the unique intimacy of my culture and its ontology. And it's not just a social structure. It's not just a story. Some of it is. Some of it's just a story. But some of it is actually sacred. It's a true ontology of sacredness. But my chosenness got mediated through an ethnocentric prism, which caused enormous cruelty. So that's a, that's a much, that's how we can begin to enact a new world. Does that make sense, my friend? Yeah. So I think, um, take it I away. Think, it's all yours. Well, now we've got a few open tabs, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bridge us to, since we, since you brought it up, we'll, we'll take, make this about the Mormons. <laughs> so I, because this is, because this is my story. So, okay. Uh, so, you know, this, this, this is actually when I was earlier speaking to how I think the crux of this is the self. And I think that's what this is really about is because it's how it's our story of how, who we are, our place in the universe and how we relate to it. Beautiful. And this is, and this is, um, you know, just from my perspective, growing up fundamentalist Mormon, which basically means like you mentioned the, the monogamous God, uh, the Mormons aren't quite, you know, some of the Mormons aren't quite that monogamous. So. Uh, I grew up in, in, in the, <laughs> I grew up in the clan where, uh, 
<laughs> where God's got uh, uncountable wives, right? But 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 they still think they still think that God is monogamous with Mormonism, meaning that Mormonism is the ultimate expression. I've read so, this carefully of Christianity, and it's yeah. the best one. It's the only true Christ path. So they're paradoxically stuck. This 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 polyamorous, you know, polygamous Mormonism at its core actually is making this absurd claim that actually, actually, the only people that actually get into that celestial place are actually us who are doing it in a particular way. And everybody else is in some sense not invited. Hello. Well, That's or or they're they're invited through through the proper channel. So basically, <laughs> uh when you have a theocracy and uh, it's a dominance hierarchy and the dominance hierarchy has one particular figure at the top and that's, right. uh, you know, personified as a, as a human, uh, you know, anthropomorphized God, uh, man, God in man form, uh, in other words, man in God's image. And, and so God on the throne of his universe as the emperor of the universe, but we don't see God on his throne in the flesh. So what we see instead is his placeholder, his mouthpiece, his president of priesthood, his apostle, his prophet. And this is the same. I mean, this is a theoretic, a theocratic uh, authoritarian hierarchy yeah. that's been that's been playing out over and over and over throughout human history as the priest king. Right. I right. mean, Jesus was a Jesus was a representation of this or an expression of this as a Messiah, which is a which is a king, which is a chosen anointed one. Yeah. Uh, so so this is, um, you know, this isn't a new idea. This is a, an I it's actually one of the um, the craziest things to me about Mormonism is that it's it's happened recently enough that was still just like front and center right around us. And so like in Utah, it's it's front and center, you know, Mormon temples going up all every day, like all the time. It's like. Uh, while there's also this exodus happening because of the age of AI and the age of podcasts and the age of information. So what I was kind of hoping and one of my intentions for this conversation with you, and I was finding myself getting a little antsy, even though I really appreciate your riffs. I've, I've, I've read your book, First Principles and First Values, yours and Zach's and, and, and uh, Ken's book. And I, uh, I would love to go deeper in that conversation with you. And I'm, I'm of the particular... Um, persuasion or whatever you'd say orientation where like i'll go as deep as you want to go you know what i mean like i will make time to go as deep as you want to go and i will make sure that i understand you and you know that i understand you and i will try to be the bridge for your idea because it's it's missing 95 percent of the humans right now like at the level you're giving it to me is, is my perspective it's what i think so what what i would like to do is try to bridge your idea and i'm this is what true north project is this is a synthesis of perspectives and you are an attractor of so many different wisdom traditions and different lineages and you you're networked into and you're reading all these you're polymath so it's like you're going in all the different directions so that's me as well. I'm a generalist. And so like, I would love to get as much of the signal as I can muster, as I can, as I can manage. And I want to bring the audience along for the ride because my, my little sister is listening to this and my little brother's listening to this. And I've got, you know, a tribe of fundamentalist Mormons. All I'm around in. Me. So, I'm in. Okay. Let's go. Cool. Let's cool. go. Bro. All right, let's do it. So for me, the, uh, thank you, by the way. And thank you for, thank you for your attention and your time. And I really appreciate it. We're so, in. We're in. So um, the story of the theocratic prophet king, Joseph Smith, right, who gets the privilege, the sacred privilege of being the one person who kind of has direct access to God, kind of plugged in. Right. And and of course he is. He's he's in the holy of holies basically all the time. He's in the sacred grove. He's in right. his 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 hat is the holy of holies as he puts his face into it and sees the uh sees the letters of the Book of Mormon, which is a translation right. of a of a of an ancient lost of a text of an ancient lost civilization that I colonized know, know. the Americas. I know, I know it well. Yeah. Yeah. So so he gets this direct connect access, and then he gets the authority to give sort of a, uh, the same sort of idea, the same lineage, the same current, the same authority, but not necessarily at his level. So further down the chain, he can promote people lower in the dominance hierarchy than him as his, as his apostles, as his um, sort of council, as his quorum of men that can then also give it down to the lower levels of priesthood bearers, right? So you end up at, with, the, with the young boy at 12 getting the priesthood as a deacon. And so this is the lineage that's available to the men, right? And, and this, this is not available to the women in the same way or really in any way. Like there's a, there's a story yeah. 
that they're sort of like holding it with their husbands, but they're they're not invited to the meetings. You know what I mean? No, they're not. No, the, I mean, the, 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 you know, no, the tragic, right? right? But both the Mormon relationship to women and right to to many other things. But but what you're pointing out is now now let's go kind of short here, little 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 chunks. So Mormonism, right? And as you correctly point out, other systems like this get something enormously right and something tragically wrong. Right, tragically wrong, structurally wrong, not in the structure of the universe, which is as follows. The notion that I can become metatron, right, let's use that language, which is kind of the language of scripture, that I can become a, a man god, right? Meaning I can actually become a person who is activated, right, who is filled with love, right? Who who actually is is a an active agency of divinity in the world. That realization is a great truth of all of the great traditions. However, that notion is a democratized notion, right? There is no source, there's no legitimate source, right, to claim that there's only one human being that can do that. That's actually a violation, right, of the intrinsic structure of cosmos. And there's even, there's even a deeper problem, which is authority, right? Authority means that you have authority over me, meaning you have access I don't have, which actually is, tells me how I can be. But if I am what I would call a unique self, which we'll talk about, which means I'm an utterly irreducibly unique expression of the divine, which is not, I'm not just a separate self, I'm utterly unique, intended by cosmos, well then my uniqueness gives me my own channel and in some sense, I have to be self-authoring. And if I'm self-authoring, I have to actually have some independent authority over myself, right? So any claim of any kind of guru, whether it's a king priest or a Buddhist guru or a rabbi, it doesn't matter, which says, I have authority over you, either because I'm the only one with direct transmission, that's a dogma. That's not interior science. That's not mysticism right? There's, that's never been validated in history. And it's also making a claim, which is not, the claim being made is insane, which is not only am I the most realized one in my day, I'm making it a dogmatic claim that I'm the most realized one that will ever be. But how can you make that claim, right? And so this is the place where, again, Mormonism has this great intuition. Wow, I can have a direct channel to the divine. Beautiful. But then to go the next step and claim that channel is only mine and it gives me authority over you, we've now moved into dogma. We moved out of the realm of spirit into the realm of politics and dogma. And that's tragic. Yeah, and, and into the realm of, of psychopathy with some of these leaders because they, they are using it and they're grabbing the ring of power and they're wielding it and they're being bent by the power. So mm -hmm. this, is, this, is a, this is a problem. It's, an, very, it's a very ancient and old thing. I mean, if you just look at the, the like I said, the, the, the god kings and the emperors of the past, right? And like this is, when you have that as your sort of uh, political and, and theological structure, then uh, it's really easy to just personify all that onto your story about God. And so God is sort of like this, uh, like you're, 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 you're ending up with stories similar to like you're born into sin. And, and there's this sort of uh, sense of the separation or the separate self, the, the, the fallen angel or fallen soul, like to be, tr to be on tr uh, probation, to be on some sort of, um, you know, like trial by, life <laughs> you know what i mean where you're where you're proving you're proving something you're proving your worth you're proving your that you're going to make it for the final grade and you're going to get into the celestial kingdom and then you will be rewarded with infinite increase if you're if you're a man you'll be you know you'll have infinite wives basically you'll just have like planets of humans in the future or something so the mormons create this this um if you think about it sort of at all like if you start to think about this at all you start to you start to realize there's something wrong with the story like if you really fill into this story then you, you know you start to ask questions pretty quickly like you know well what about the the um the women first of all like in this conversation it's very strange like you know how does it work out that you just have one one man with say thousands of wives in heaven 
or like dozens of wives on earth, right? Like that's happened for sure. Warren Jeffs, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, et cetera. You know, so you've got, you've got men who are with harems of women. Um, some of them, like in Joseph Smith's case, other men's wives and, and children too young for marriage and stuff. So it's like, this is, this is problematic, but, but what about the ratio of that? If, if the human species or if, if souls are incarnating on a level that is like mostly 50, 50, and then you've got one guy with, uh, dozens or thousands of wives. Well, how can that work in, in your story? What about, what about the, the shortage? What about all the extra guys essentially? Right. right. And it's no, like, no. well, 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 they're just, they're just kind of fucked. Like, and this is a chosen thing again, right? It's a chosen. We're the chosen 144,000 so elevated let's, to this level of track, Godhood. Let's, let's track here, brother. So good. Yes, good. Let's go back to what you said in the beginning, which I thought was so great, right? Which is you're in your project in your 30s, right? Which is, okay, in my 20s, I threw the baby out. Now I'm trying to figure out what bathwater is worth filling up my cup with. And bathwater is not a good image for filling up a cup, but we got the, <laughs> right, right? So, so. What we need to do with Mormonism and what we need to do with, with all the great religions, but let's just talk about Mormonism is say, okay, what in Mormonism is holy? And actually, you know, when I, I lived for two years in Salt Lake, as I think I shared with you when we were talking in our free time, and I, I, I wound up there for all sorts of reasons. So I spent two very, very intense years. I actually gone through a personal tragedy. And I wound up spending kind of the two years kind of in recovery from that in Salt Lake. And I would actually go to the temple myself late at night and kind of walk around the temple. I read Joseph Smith intensely, right? And I met both the, in, and I spoke to quite a few of kind of some kind of key people in the kind of infrastructure of the church. And I won't, I won't get them in trouble by saying their name, but I was kind of, you know, having, you know, some, some very deep conversations with people kind of deep in the system. and. I met both the intense beauty of the Mormon vision and the intense corruption, right, of the the structure which had become a dogmatic story that couldn't be challenged, right? And those are both true, right? And so what we can do is we can say, okay, what are the 10 most beautiful sacred insights of Mormonism? And now let's democratize them, right? In other words, in other words it's actually not the president priest, we're all actually president priests, right? And let's actually go back to the original text, which says in the book of Exodus, you shall be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, right? And that actually, actually every human being, right, actually responds to the unique call of the divine who says you're an irreducibly unique expression of the love, intelligence, and love, beauty of all that is, that lives in you, as you, and through you, that never was, is, or will be ever again other th than through you. And as such, your unique divine charisma right, has the capacity to stand on the abyss of darkness and say, let there be light in a way that no one else that ever was, is, or will be can do other than you. And as such, you are a king priest, right? and we are in devotion to you, and you have a certain self-authority that no one can violate. It's like, oh, but, but that, so in other words, it's up to you, Christian, and it might not, this might not be your particular path, but it's up to the next generation of Mormons not to throw out, right, you know, the kind of creative gesture, right, of Mormonism, which is kind of shocking. I mean, Mormonism manages to create a great tradition in the mid-19th century. Who did that? I mean, it's this shocking explosion of energy. I mean, it's actually unimaginable. This is not, this is, this wasn't started when Islam started. This is when it started Christianity. It certainly wasn't started when Judaism did. This is not Confucianism or Taoism. This is upstate New York in the mid 1800s. I mean, what the fuck? Right. I mean, it's, it's yeah. humble, right. So, but that tells you there's a spark of the sacred there. Something was happening. And, and, and there was, Joseph Smith had some very important intuitions as did Brigham Young. And so, it's up to you, this is your job, not mine, right, to liberate, right, how does a person actually be a, not a Jack Mormon, but a new kind of Mormon where I'm, I'm committed to the lineage, but I'm evolving this lineage, right? So I'm actually I'm, participating in the, the evolution of Mormonism. I'm, I'm, I'm down for that challenge, but, but you're, this is the, this is the, um, take it away, I'm following you. 
All right. So this is the, this is the problem or the crux of it is that, um, I'm the, the thing that I'm, so one of these, one of these deep, deep primordial stories is that we have, we have a need to belong and we evolved in tribal contexts and we evolved in hunter gatherer bands and societies of deep human relationships. And so we have a need to belong and to fit in. And I have that just like everybody else. And so I grew up in this place with this deep sense of camaraderie and belonging, which is part of what the Mormons have got right, 100%. Yeah. And, and I'm with you on that. And there's, I grew up in a tight knit version of that because I grew up in a fundamentalist version of that in a small right. town where it was very much us against the world or us as, a, as separate from the world, as an insular society, all believing the same ideological uh, bent towards you know, this theocratic structure uh, back to Joseph Smith and Jesus and, and God or Adam, the father. Right. So it's like, this is a patriarchal line of authority that claims its lineage back at Adam through Jesus, Jesus through Joseph Smith, and then Joseph Smith down to John Timpson, who is the current instantiation of the cult that right. I grew up in. Right? Just, just stay, stay with me for a second. So if that claim was made, and I, I know a, a whole bunch of people in town just like you grew up, because I was, I, was, I was in that world, obviously you grew up in it. But if that claim was made, and, and then along with that claim, we would say, and there are 10,000 other parallel lineages in the world that trace themselves back all the way to Adam and to the divine, and we're all unique instruments in the symphony. We're all playing music in our unique instruments. I'd say, enjoy your town and all 23, you know, whatever, whatever the size of the family is, right? Have a good time. But actually, the Mormon claim goes tragic because it says, actually, we're the only true frequency and we're the only people who are going to the celestial kingdom. And everyone else, by definition, is outside eternity. Well, that's actually a gross ethical violation. I agree a thousand percent. I think it's pathological. I think it's, it's performing some sort of spiritual genocide on the rest of reality, right? What? And it's very, it's quite, it's quite fucked up when you well, tease well it apart. Said, Christian. That's well said, brother. That's exactly right. You're basically saying I, we are throwing all of the rest of Christianity and the rest of the world out of the kingdom of heaven. That's a quite violent act, right? And, and so how do you, and it's such a Tai Chi, how do you, and, and this again, you know, there's a lot we have to talk about in terms of unique self and self, and, and we will get to all of it. But I really, we started with story and I, I wanted to really just honor your story, right? Because you're, you're, this podcast is about you, it's about your story. I'm your guest and I'm in your living room. How do you do this Tai Chi, my friend? How do you, and I want to give you an image from, from Luria, from Hebrew wisdom, that kind of one of the images that shaped the Renaissance, Habermas loves the image. But basically you've got light that goes into vessels. The light's too intense for the vessels. The vessels shatter. Then you have broken vessels spread through the world. Then the tzaddik, the master, comes and liberates the spark of light from the broken vessel. Mormonism is, Mormonism is broken vessels. You're the master. You're the avatar, my brother. Right? You're the tzaddik. How do you liberate the sparks of light from the broken vessels of Mormonism and weave them together into a vision that can actually speak to the, the, the tens of thousands of the next generation of Mormonism, and on the one hand, don't want to abandon the community. On the other hand, they know deep in their hearts that it's corrupt and wrong in some fundamental way, and they have no place to go. They're left with a, a Sophie's choice. So yeah. you, you speak to them. That's, that's yours to do, my friend. Yeah, I've been, I've been uh, first, like I said, retracing light, my steps. Light, con light conversation we're having here. <laughs> no, but it's one that I've been having with myself and with, and with with God for a long for a long time. So basically, I left when I was 20 years old because I read a document, and I've talked about the document, you know, a couple of times, different podcast episodes where I've I actually uh, had Jeremy Runnels on my podcast and talked about the CES letter, which is sort of a culmination of, of evidence about the historical inaccuracies of the Book of Mormon and, and sort of what the Book of Mormon actually is. And so I don't want to go down into the weeds about that. But the only okay. reason I bring that up is because we have to do a bit of discernment and dispelling before I can give my vision of what I would say is putting the pieces back together. So like, um, 
you have to let it shatter first before you can put the pieces back together. And, and, and the light has to shatter it. So the light would be the truth. The light would be true North. Yeah. It's like the only thing that can set you free is the truth. That's the only thing that can set you free. And that's what shatters the vessels, right? And it's the penetration of the light into the vessel. The vessel can't hold the light, which is the intensity of depth and truth. And it's truth and love together. Yeah. It's not just truth. It's truth and error. It's truth and love together. The vessels shatter. But again, right, the spark of light is in the vessel. And in some sense, what postmodernism did, and takes us back to the beginning of our conversation, postmodernism said, let's shatter the vessels. And they were right. And my colleague Jordan Peterson is wrong when he dismisses postmodernism, right, as a kind of, you know, evil Marxist Leninist force, although there's some of that there in critical theory. But, but there's actually something deeper there's a holy impulse. An evolutionary impulse in postmodernism, which says, as you said so beautifully, right, young man, right? It says, I'm older, so I get to say things like young man, right? <laughs> you know, right? We got to shatter those vessels, right? But then you have this unique capacity. Or you have this unique capacity. And well, I got a, we got a lot. We're doing a lot at the center. That we're doing this new story of value. We'll get to that. But I'm, I'm more interested in you and your story right now, right? You have this unique capacity, not just to shatter the vessels. You're right. You have to be a shatterer. You have to be Abraham. Abraham you got to be an iconoclast. Icon. You classed icons. You've got to shatter. You got to be an iconoclast. You got to shatter the vessels. But then you have to be of that rare breed that is so rare today that not just shatters. And then you're going to go to those broken vessels and you're going to liberate those sparks. You're going to weave them together into something so unbearably beautiful, so compelling, so inviting, so needed, right? And a new instrument in the symphony, because right now, the Mormon instrument particularly, right, is this very important instrument. It's not by accident that uh, what Harold was to Harold before he died, Harold Bloom right, who I'm sure you've come across his work from Yale, right, like me, he got fascinated with Mormonism, right? He said, and it basically he said essentially what I said earlier, which was, how'd they do this, right, in the mid-19th century? So, so yes, yes on the corruption. And, and, you know, you've lived inside of, and for whatever reason, when I was there, I engaged, you know, five or six or seven people, and I heard tragic stories of corruption, right? And so I, I got it, you know, and of abuse and corruption that, that were valid. So there's, there's, there's an underbelly that's not discussed and that's hidden. And so let's shatter those vessels. And, and there's a new instrument in world religion, which is going to be enacted by the next generation, not of Jack Mormons, but of, of Mormons that actually flock to you, together with you, enact this new story. And I'm excited to see that. And I'm, I'm, I'm calling for that. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about you and that, because who else can do that? It's a big deal. It's, it's, uh, it's a strange, it's a strange uh, thing to hear and a strange thing to be, you know, participating in, in some sense, but like, uh, and this is this... a rabbi, this is a rabbi telling you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so it's funny. <laughs> It's funny because, um, uh, you know, I found out about you through, through, uh, Aubrey's podcast. So I'm, I'm sure you're, you know, you're familiar with the, with what ayahuasca is, but, yes. um, I had an experience on ayahuasca when I was, uh, when I was 26, uh, that, that shaked. So I, I left, I left when I was 20 years old from this, from this, from this cult, from this church, uh, stopped when I stopped participating, when I stopped going to meeting, because I read this document from Jeremy Reynolds. And just on a side tangent quickly, because I think it's worth mentioning, for anyone who's listening who's like, hey, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, you can check out that podcast with Jeremy if you'd like, or you could read the CES letter, which would be even better. Or you could check out like Johnny Harris's YouTube channel. He's an ex-Mormon who's doing some amazing, he's done a couple of amazing videos on the history of Mormonism and sort of the story of, of, of the Mormon exodus out to the West and the, the whole theology behind all that. So it's like, if you want a, a good understanding of, from a very, uh, from someone who's been on the inside and who's also trying to see it objectively from the outside in a more historical lens, it's, uh, there's a lot out there. I mean, I don't want to ramble on, but, but I want those resources to be available to you yeah, if totally. you're going to. I'm going to hold for one more second. I apologize. I got to digress one more time. 
So while, while Mark's away, I'll just keep uh, riffing. But because I, I really do feel for you if, if you're on the fence, if you're um, having any sort of doubts, or if you're not having doubts and you just want to go disprove me, uh, or if you just want to know for yourself what, what the other argument against your, say, faith is, right? Um, so it's, it's, it's about following your curiosity to the edge of your understanding and then having the courage to go a little further. Right. And that's that's the cave that you fear to enter, but it holds the treasure that you seek, as Joseph Campbell would say. So I would say it's time to go on a hero's journey uh, if you find yourself in that in that um, type of situation, because as Mark's talking to here um, and he spoke earlier on in the podcast, we're we're in a critical moment of crisis. So so that's so Mark's back. So, hey, um, to to bridge to repiecing the picking it back together, I I after leaving. Uh, I had sort of just medicated and I sort of just numbed it out and I sort of avoided it and I didn't really address the deeper, the deeper stuff. And then I had some experiences at 25 with float tanks and with psychedelics. And this started my journey into my hero's journey and, and my sort of truth seeking sort of uh, odyssey. And, and this led me to an experience in the uh, Colombian uh, Andes with uh, a elder of a ayahuasca lineage from the Ecuador, from the Amazon that Beautiful. pulled out this sort of the energetic sort of shadow expression of what I would call the shadow king of, of Mormonism or of any of these sort of lineages, which is, which is basically the, the patriarchal, patriarchal authoritarian sort of theocratic hierarchy, right? So Jesus being the quintessential example of that. So what came out for me, and this has been like years of integration since, and it's, it's been difficult, right? It's been a lot, but like the, the, what came up for me was this shadow expression of the Christ and, and this idea of the Christ as Jesus Christ and as just one uh, person, one individual, one, one human being, one man who is the sort of king of the universe and who, when he returns, will reign for a thousand years and there will be fire for those who get in his way and there will be blessings for those who are, you know, praising his return. So, so basically... I had to go through my own sort of savior Christ complex that got sort of projected onto me by my patriarchal backstory plus my name. And, and this was all in my shadow, just like being sort of purged right. by the medicine. And it was intense. But the point, the point I'm getting to is that to start picking up the pieces, uh, well, first, you know, do the homework on Joseph Smith, right? Cause that's the, that's the way in. And then it takes you to Jesus for sure. If you want to keep going further, right? <laughs> like, I will, I, I'll just, uh, I will, I will help you with this. Right? I'm up. This is a serious offer. I will help you with this. Right? This is important. Your journey is important, you know. And you know, we started talking about story, and I know you wanted to talk about self today. And and really, I spend most of my time talking about self and cosmogonic humanism and the new story of value. But but we talked about story, and and it was it, it's really important to to feel into what I would call Christian kind of your sacred autobiography, right? This is, this is a sacred text. Your sacred autobiography is a sacred text. It's a unique sacred text and there's no accidental meetings, right? In other words, I mean, Aubrey and I met also in kind of that way. We've been studying together every week for a couple of years, you know, it kind of a deep, he's take, taken a deep dive with me into the lineage, but, but, and, and he's done a really beautiful, beautiful, you know, walk and continues to do so, but it's a different path. You have this, this very, and, and Abbas is actually, you know, also very, very connected with me. We've talked a lot about enacting this, this vision of a world religion in which each, each instrument has this unique quality. And you've gone on this journey, right? I'm just kind of feeling, and I'm just, just thinking slowly and feeling slowly. And, you know, you know, the shadow description of this, this, you know, medicine journey you did with a kind of the shadow Christ gets kind of expunged and, and you kind of have to liberate yourself from that, your own kind of king, priest, messianic, it's a very beautiful story. It's a holy story. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm, I can just feel it now. Right. And, and again, I'm putting everything that I talk about aside. I, I'm more interested in, in, in this. I mean, it's like, Christian, the best is ahead, right? It's a, right, you've just gotten started, right? The best is ahead. It's a, it's an, it's not just an exciting journey. And if, again, if you'll permit me to, 
to be older than you, which I am. So what can you do? You know, by a couple of decades, right? It's just, just, there's a, like, just, just, you know, not as a rabbi or as a teacher or as a philosopher, just as a, a big brother, as a friend, just the blessing of the father, right? That there's, I'll just give you like the, the deep blessing of the father. I just feel it welling up and I'm, it's a big calling. It's not, it's not a small journey. It's not an easy journey, but, but it's one that, that you can do and you will do and, and we need you to do it. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, you know, given that, given that ayahuasca trip and, um, you know, the, the backstory of it, it's like, I've, I've had an allergy, you know what I mean to it? Where, 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 where every time, I mean, it, it just becomes front and center primarily when I talk to, you know, charismatic or powerful father figures, you know, males, right? Like, <laughs> it, like alpha males, right? Especially. Lo, lo uh, and behold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's interesting as I'm like getting uh, enough self-awareness, you know, with floating and with sort of these different tools for introspection and, and reading a lot. And honestly, big, big under, like something I thought was, is, is underrated that I didn't realize was so critical, which is sense making with other human beings. Like this is actually where we do logos or dialogos. It's, that's how we reason. We do it together. And so, you know, we need to have somebody who can check our blind spots. And so I will, uh, I will gladly check yours, my friend. And I hope you can do the same for me because one thing that I am, am incredibly allergic to now because of all this <laughs> is, is anyone who wants to go for the ring of power or who has any sort of, um, who has any sort of messianic complex where this is about me. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and that's, and that's something I'm, 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 I'm nervous about acquiring as well. So I need, I need to surround myself with humans who will check the fuck out of me because what you're talking about is, is basically that, you know what I mean? You're talking about, not, not, not really, but it just goes slow with me for a second. Go slow, go slow, go slow. Let's, 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 let's go. So let's make some distinctions. Okay. So, so you, you, you access the, the, you know, Tolkien's term, the ring of power, right? So the response to the ring of power, which is what we've done at the center, right? Is the fellowship of the ring. Right. Yes. Right. And so, so for example, for example, we're writing a great library here. So this is just one example. So in the great library, there's three vectors of books, but there's a primary vector of 10 books that are written by David J. Temple. And you saw one of them. And so, for example, right, one of the key things I want to do is take my name off the books. And so it's not, it's not, it doesn't become kind of a win-lose metrics project of a philosopher author who's building his career and grabbing the ring of power. We don't have time for that, my friend. It's actually boring, wildly unloving, and, and doesn't work. At the same time, at the same, here's the paradox, right? You need to actually give your unique gift in the most potent and powerful and beautiful way you can. And so I think that there's a way, and one of the, one of the structures of the think tank is what we call a unique self symphony. Unique self symphony means there's you know, and there's truly a symphony, right? Of of great 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 beautiful beings that actually, in the end, are playing in the same field of music. So, I've tried to always, my friend, surround myself, whether it's my students or my friends, with people where the system is. You know, there's no words that can't be spoken. And that doesn't mean all words should be spoken all the time. Every truth has its temple. But but basically, right, it's always about being madly loving. It's always about clear feedback. It's always about let's find our blind spots. Let's look at them clearly. Right, right. And then the second we get to a place, I always say to people in my own world, if I ever tell you what to do, you should get up and leave. Right. And and if you don't you don't feel you can give me feedback, you know, you may be right or wrong, but if you feel I don't listen, leave. Right. And that's a that's that's the core of our world. So it's possible. This is what I'm trying to I'm trying to find with you. It's possible to to and again, you, you can you can press delete on this whole thing. But I, I get the beauty of the fear of the Ring of Sarum, which has been a theme that that's a legitimate fear. Right? That's not that's not crazy. Right. Lots of people have gotten it. But the way you counteract is with the Fellowship of the Ring. Yeah. And, and I, and I, I'm with you a thousand percent and I, I've since, you know, sort of, uh, made the decision, uh, to, 
to do what I can to push through my sort of uh, my my own insecurities and whatnot, and do what is mine to do, and 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 actually like show up fully full send. Don't die wondering. And I'm and I'm with you on that. Like earlier, what you're talking about 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 this need to um, to save that baby from the bathwater and to also shine light and shatter what's not true. Like that has to happen. So, um, because you mentioned at the beginning, we're at a, a critical moment where you, you're in trembling and, and so am I, and I'm, I'm trying to become a father. And it's like, that is, that is the, um, the only thing I give a fuck about is the, is the future of, of the more beautiful future that we could, that we could co-create with this, with this, um, unique self symphony that you're speaking about the idea that we could have the, the beautiful synthesis of, of the self and the, and the collective of the sovereignty of the individual and the creative of the creativity of the, and the uniqueness of each person and the coherent coordinated collective, which is capable as fuck. And that is what we should be doing. We're capable of, of, of any miracle, uh, you know, we're capable of all this technology and magic. We're capable of regenerative culture and a protopian future and a coordinated global, um, what would you say? Like win, win, infinite game. Right. So, so no, completely right. And completely beautiful. Let's just notice something as, as we're finishing and it's a big deal. Okay. So, you know, when, when I came on, I didn't have a particular topic to talk about, and I was delighted to, 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 you know, follow you. And we did a, we did a big riff and an important riff on story. That was its own piece, which we can kind of unpack at a different time. We wanted to get to self, but actually I'll just share with you just personally, intimately, what happened for me was I got much more interested in you. Like, who is this? Right. And what I did, I just want you to notice it, even if we would never speak to each other again, I bracketed myself. I'm, you know, probably 25, 30 years older than you. I've probably read a book or two more. Right. And, you know, I've got a little bit to say, and I'm not incapable of saying it. That all became uninteresting to me. And, and I have a desperate need to say it because I think it desperately needs to be said for all the reasons that we, we enunciate it. But actually, the person in front of me became much more interesting. Right. So, and it's basically what I did is not consciously, but naturally I just bracketed myself. I said, who is this guy and how can I be of service to him in this small amount of period, you know, time we have? And, you know, what I sensed was, and you can correct me or delete me or whatever is all fine, but I say this with great honor. I sensed both your power and some fear of it. And what just occurred to me was that actually supporting and articulating a vision of you stepping into that right, actually is that which is most aligned with my vision in the world, which is about religion and world religion. And here I am talking to a, a, a kind of a born and bred native of kind of Mormonism. And there's a way to actually carry the ring, but not like Frodo did. You know, Frodo said, right, it's mine to carry the ring. And Sam says, right, you know, okay, I can't carry the ring, but I can carry you which is beautiful. It's a beautiful moment. And it's, a, it's one of the beautiful moments in Tolkien. But actually, the fellowship can carry the ring together. No, no one person should carry the ring, right? And Gandalf gets that. And Gandalf's not a weak ass. <laughs> and and Gandalf's kind of a, you know, a kick ass, you know, wild. So you, you can be in your full power. You can surround yourselves with people who will check you. You can also have appropriate hierarchies. Hierarchies are not bad. Right, I love my teachers. Right, and my teacher when I was nineteen, I would I would stand outside his room, so I walk out and just because he was, and I just wanted to hear and see how he was ethical in the world. And so we can actually have teachers also. We don't all need to be. We can have appropriate teacherly. My friend Zach Stein writes about teacherly authority. Right, we can have appropriate teacherly authority. We don't need. To, so there's a. I'm excited about this. This is an exciting articulation of what's possible, and so. In a certain sense, we didn't do the big story, but we did this really exciting and important one, which is a model for the whole thing. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. And and thank you for thank you for your words, um, and for your support and for your intent. And I um, I I feel like the I'm for, I'm far enough along in this in this path, you know, I guess twelve years into it or something, where 
where I feel like I'm, I've, I've integrated enough, I've healed enough and I've integrated enough to, um, to step up to the plate. And I feel like, uh, I think it's, it's, it, there, there's no fucking time to waste actually. <laughs> so like, we might right. as well go for it, you know, full send. So, um, I'm, I'm, I know you're I'm mindful of the time you got to go. And so it's like, I, I would love to, to continue the conversation. And, um, and, and, I, and I think so that let's, let's do next time self, cause you were right. Yeah. Let's do the uh, next this, podcast just on self. The yeah, and I, self. Let's just do that. I'm, I'm in, I'm I, up for that. I'm down for that. Perfect. Thank you. And, and, uh, for me, just as a preface, like the self and the Jesus story have to be reconciled. And so this is, this is the, the, the healing of the wound of the father as well. And, and, and by, 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 uh, consequence, the wounding of the feminine, right. That when the wounding of the earth, so we have to heal our relationship to that and to our relationship to the, to the sacred and our relationship to the water and our relationship to the sacred mother and, and, and the sacred feminine. So I'm a hundred percent down to go on the ride as, as deeply as possible. And true North project is basically just me trying to open source this ride as much as possible. And, and I would be honored to, you know, host you and any other thinkers on our publication and, and use this as a platform to um, shine that light as bright as possible. Let's do it. Let's do it. My friend. A big hug. Lots and lots yeah. of love. Much yeah. love. Thank you. Good Sabbath. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that deep dive with uh, Mark. And um, as you heard us say, we will definitely be continuing the conversation. And I'm not sure exactly how long this one's going to ride, but um, I'm hoping that it's a door opener of many, of many kinds. And this will um, hopefully open a deeper conversation and, and a deeper exploration of this project. So both in the direction of, of individual, you know, sovereignty and, and the reclamation of our, you know, inherent creativity and power, and also in the conversation around our collective sense-making and the way in which we can, you know, play the infinite game together. So with that being said, I'm going to do my first official plug <laughs> of, uh, of, of a sponsor. So I uh, recently just tried out my favorite edibles. And by recently, I mean like a few months ago, um, I found a, uh, my, one of my favorite podcasters and comedians, D uh, Duncan Trussell. Um, he had uh, turned me on through his podcast to a brand of edibles called Lumi. So the company is called Lumi Labs. If you want to check them out, there'll be a link in the description. And of course, I have a discount code, baby. <laughs> but you have to stick around to the end of this conversation to get it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, discount code is True North. It'll save you 20%. And um, it will support this project and support the podcast if you use the code. So um, thank you for your support. If you are a, you know, if you're looking to get high <laughs> already, but if, um, if you want more of a, of a conversation around that, I will be having some conversations uh, uh, soon, actually, with some experts in the cannabis sector and in the world of, of cannabis. So we can go deep, deep on that conversation. If you're somebody who's cannabis curious, but you're like, hey, I don't know uh, how I feel about taking this right now. So it's like that's that's something that's coming if you're if you're hesitant. And if you're somebody who's like, hey, um, you know, why are these good edibles? <laughs> that's, that's the real important question. Uh, so Lumi basically is doing everything right, as far as I can tell. And, and I'm looking, uh, you know, critically at it to see if there's something I'm missing. And I've been, you know, asking the right questions, I think, but they make everything from organic hemp. So there's, there's two things to understand about, about Lumi. Number one is they're the highest quality product you're going to find if you're looking for an edible, like cannabis edible. So they are from organic strain specific cannabis, which means that they take the best grown organic crops from the Northwest and they find the best strains of that. And then they take those strains and they, and they gently harvest and extract the cannabinoids and terpenes uh, and create organic fruit edibles that taste delicious and no fillers, no bullshit, no, no poison, no dyes, nothing, none of that. It's all just like good high quality, and you're getting the entire profile and entourage effect of the strain, which is what I've been looking for for a long time. You know, one of the things that's been a bummer about switching to edibles, because I don't like to smoke cannabis anymore, just because 
uh, you know, smoking in general is kind of a bummer on fertility and it's a bummer on, um, you know, your health. And so it's like, it's also kind of like a gateway into smoking other shit. And then you find out you've got like a nicotine vape and you're just hitting that all the time. And then that's never gone. <laughs> and then you just got that forever and it's permanent. And no one will ever put them down. It's like, fuck. So no more, no more uh, smoking for me, but as much as I can, you know, once in a while, I'm not going to say never, but like the edibles, um, hit in a way that is predictable because they're all dosed the same. So it's like five milligrams of THC is the dose. Uh, if that sounds like a lot, then just take half of one at first to see, get your sea legs. It's probably a good idea if you're new to cannabis, but basically, um, you're not just getting five milligrams of THC because somebody took some THC in an isolate and injected it into a product. What you're getting is, uh, the full, the full profile of the plant, um, with that five milligrams of THC and five milligrams of all of the other minor cannabinoids and terpenes. So you're getting like this, you know, each one of these edibles, like the one that I'm currently talking to you on, which is called Durban Skittles. And it's, uh, you know, a cross between Durban Poison, which is my favorite cannabis strain because it lets me be more focused, lets me be more alert, lets me have memory recall and, and a functioning conversational mind. And I don't lose trains of thought because I'm on like some sort of like, you know, THC bomb or I'm on some sort of, um, I don't know what you call it, like a, like a foggy headed high, right? So, you know, every strain is going to be different. They have nine different strains. You can sort of find the, the one that works for you. I recommend just, you know, the only way to really know is to try them. So uh, if you're in Southern Utah, if you're in St. George, come on over to True North Float. We have the best place on earth to try them, uh, <laughs> which is basically to say, I would try it in a float tank. That's the best place to get high on cannabis edibles. Um, basically, what cannabis does is it it creates this new awareness or this new sort of way of thinking um, about if you've never done it before, you know, that's just expect an adventure that's going to be um, beneficial, most likely. Now, I'm not going to make some sort of prescription that everyone should do cannabis, of course. So this isn't like, hey, you know, you must get high, <laughs> but if you want, if you want to enjoy, um, the, one of the most safe and mild ways of experiencing an altered state of consciousness that has, uh, a track record of, of, of being used as a medicine and being used as, um, lots of different sacramental uses for cannabis. So, you know, there's, there's lots of cultures who have, who have recognized the powerful effects of, of cannabis as a teacher and a master plant. And this is something that, you know, I've come to realize with my use of cannabis primarily in the float tank and then with my yoga practice. So as an embodiment tool, as a way to get deeper into the body and to get beyond the mind and to get into different aspects of the mind and to, you know, experience a new type of, of way of relating to yourself, um, maybe try Lumi edible in a float tank if you've never done that before or, or take it and do some yoga or go do it at a different float center, you know what I mean, other than True North. But True North, we're not going to, you know, make it weird and, and act like, you know, you can't be high on an edible. Like you're an adult and you have sovereignty over your own state of consciousness. Now there's a second thing to understand about Lumi because you're probably like, oh, he's selling what? <laughs> it's like, oh my God, we're in 2024. There's still people who are like, cannabis is bad. Ah. Well, not, a, not, a, not every drug is for everyone. And, and I'm not saying that it's going to be good for everyone, but alcohol is bad for everyone. <laughs> It's not good for anyone. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's physically damaging to your brain and to your liver and to your body. So it's like cannabis um, at least is is a huge step in the right direction. Definitely don't want to become dependent on it. Definitely don't want to become dependent on 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 anything that you have to take every day. You know, maintain sovereignty and choice. So that's the that's you know your responsibility, not mine. But uh, the edibles are a hundred percent the best and they're a hundred percent legal. So this is, this is sort of the new development, uh, that I didn't realize until recently. And that's why we haven't been selling stuff like this in the past. Um, well, we kind of have, we've sold these like hemp lucid products, which are really great. And they have, uh, they have, they have hemp and they also have some functional mushrooms. And so I'm all, I'm all a fan of that kind of stuff, but th these edibles hit the ones I'm talking about hit actually like, uh, like an actual edible. So, um, they are 100% legal because of the farm bill. So what this means is that you will be able to experience legal, safe, um, organic, high-quality cannabis in an environment that is 
that is both ethical and intentional and safe once again. And so we will create um, the right experience over at True North Float if that's something that you are curious about. Um, and that is sort of a unique thing as far as I can tell uh, that's available in the world. Um, I'm sure there's, you know, there's plenty of other places where you could go, say, take an edible and get in a float tank. But could you go and do that and be in the perfect environment um, both, you know, because there's no, there's no paranoia if it's not against the rules. Do you see what I'm saying? Like you're taking something legal and my business is saying, okay, you're right. Like that's fine. Um, so, you know, caveats, like we'll make you sign a waiver, et cetera. And I will also figure out how to get this nine minute advertisement down to 30 seconds. Oh, Jesus Christ. This is insane. So um, if you are interested once again in Lumi Gummies, Go to lumigummies.com and uh, and use True North as your code. Your discount code is just True North. It'll give you twenty percent off, and I will get a tasty little rip of that. And then we will be able to hopefully get the world high while maintaining this podcast and fueling this fucking ship, baby. Let's go. <laughs>